Hallelujah. It's prayer time based memorial. If you'll posture yourselves so that we can go before the throne of grace, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. God, we're honored, Lord, that you call us friend. We reverence your name, Lord, because it is hallowed in the earth. You are awesome. You are mighty. You are holy. You are omnipotent. You are omniscient. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we honor you today. God, we come giving thanks on today, Father God, Lord. We give thanks, Father God, Lord, for life, for health, for strength. We give thanks on today, Lord, for the little things that we take for granted, like being able to taste our food, being able to go to the restroom unassisted. Somebody's in a nursing home or hospital that can't do those simple things. So God, we thank you for the things that we don't even think about and we're grateful. Father God, we come asking that you forgive our sins, that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Father God, Lord. But we come asking, Father God, that whatever it is that we might be dealing with in our lives, that you would meet us there. God, somebody needs a financial breakthrough, Lord, right now. Somebody needs, Lord, healing in their body right now, Lord. Somebody just needs peace of mind. Lord, you said in your word that if we would keep our minds stayed on you, that you would keep us in perfect peace. Father God, so much is going on in our nation. So much is going on in our world. We have yet to come out of this global pandemic, Father God, but you kept us in spite of. God, you kept us even in spite of ourselves. And we say thank you. God, we just ask that you would continue to move in us, continue to move through us, continue to use us in a mighty way to be a blessing to somebody else and to bring glory to your name. God, we invite you into the room on today. Saturate this sanctuary with your presence, God. Fill each one of us with your spirit, God. Bless our pastor as he prepares to bring the word. Give him strength in his body. Give him clarity in his mind. Stand up in him and deliver your word through him, God. And we'll be ever careful to give your name all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise because it is due your name. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus and every heart said amen. I love Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. If you love Jesus more than anything, I dare you to type in the comments. Jesus, I love you more than anything. Hallelujah. The psalmist declared, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Did you come to bless him on today? Come on, I know we're not back in in in-person worship yet, but wherever you are, I wish that you would open up your mouth and give God the fruit of your lips. It's all right to put your hands together and lift up his name. That's what we came to do on today. We came to lift him up. We came to magnify him. We came to glorify him because he's worthy of all the praise. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. God is so wonderful. Hallelujah. He's our savior. He's our healer. He's our deliverer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want to keep the energy high in the room on today because we serve an awesome God. And every praise, every praise is to our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, this morning's responsive reading comes from the book of Romans, the eighth chapter. I want you to meet me at the 31st verse. Amen. Tap in your Bible app if you still got a paper Bible. Crack that bad boy open. Come on, Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31, and it reads like this from the New International Version. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Somebody just shouted right there. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Is it God who just, it is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised from the dead, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all the day. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers can ever separate us from the love of God. Somebody give God a praise Hallelujah. for his holy word. Hallelujah. How many know that God is able to do? so many miraculous things in your life oh if you could just trust and believe in him in this moment if you could gather and worship with us and just praise his name we cry out hallelujah oh.
somebody needs some motivation on this morning. Come on, you gotta just tell yourself, help me say, don't give up on God. You wanna know? God will protect you every day. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Hallelujah. We cry out. Yeah. Don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Cause he won't. Cause he won't give up on God. Cause he is able. Hallelujah. Come on, just saturate your place. Come on, fill your area up with worship. Cause God can do so many things in your life. He's already worked it out. Matter of fact, if he can do it before, he can do it again. We cry out, you're able, God. You're able. You never fail us. good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I know that we're not in uh, in-person worship, but we're on our way there. And for those of you, wherever you are uh, watching this broadcast, we hope and pray that this word is going to be a blessing uh, to you. We know that the worship has been a blessing to you. I love to remind uh, those who are watching us uh, online and by streaming faith and other uh, vehicles that the uh, uh, vehicle may be virtual, but the worship is real. We're having real church in a real way here. And uh, we are waiting with tiptoe anticipation to come back to in-person worship. You'll be hearing more uh, about that in the future, the date and the time and the occasion. But we're excited about being able to gather together as the people of God. We hope you're excited about it as, as well. And I cannot wait to get there and be with you. I told you before that I'm not responsible for my behavior once we get together because I sure miss y'all. And uh, I'm hoping and praying that you all miss us uh, too. Well, uh, are y'all ready for the word out there? I hope you are ready for the word. We've got a word for you today. And uh, we're going to share with you from the word of God here after we go to God in prayer. Join me in a word of prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege of serving. Thank you for your son, our Savior, without whom we would not have eternal life. Thank you for the gift of worship and praise. But most of all, God, we thank you for you, for all that you've done and continue to do in our lives. Now, God, as we prepare for the preaching moment, we confess today that we can do nothing until you come. Bless your people. Make fallow the ground of the souls of your people, that the seed of truth might find depth, and that relationship might be established between some soul and the Savior. And then, Lord, help me, your preacher, Breathe on my words and make them thine. Rescue me from me. Fill me and empty me at your will. Love me and do whatever you want with me. You can be reckless without my permission. Hide me behind Calvary's cross. Make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only the shadow of the cross can be seen beneath. Take your glory, but Master, please give us the blessings we pray. We ask it all in the name of the pre-existent, incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and soon coming King's name we pray. All the people of God said together, amen. Right where you are, would you put your hands together for our God, who is always worthy of praise from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Um, we've started a series here, and uh, it is on the seven I Am sayings of Christ. We've already dealt with the first one, I am the bread. It is one of the metaphors 
that Jesus uses to give insight and revelatory understanding of his person and who he is and what he has come to do. And when we talked about him being the bread, when he declares that he is the bread, it came on the tail end of him feeding the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread, not including the women and children. And Jesus used that as a teachable moment to teach them that while bread sustains the physical body, he is the bread that sustains the spiritual self. And unfortunately, bread, when you eat it for the body, you eat it and hunger again. But Jesus said, when you let him into your life, he will be a satisfaction. He'll satisfy a hunger that you'll never have to satisfy or a thirst that you'll never have to satisfy again. And so we thank God that he, Jesus, is the one that satisfies the deep hunger of the human soul. Now, we're going to look at another one of the I am sayings of Christ, which again gives us the revelatory insight into the person and the power and purpose of Jesus. And so if you would, uh, turn in your Bible or tap in your Bible app back to the book of John again. And we'll be looking at John chapter 8. And we'll be looking today at just verse 12, but I want to encourage you at your leisure if you would read all the way to verse 20. Uh, but in the interest of time, I just want to read uh, verse 12 of chapter 8 of the book of Gospel of John. I'll be reading from the New International Version of the Greek Masoretic Text. If you were to turn there, you'll find these words written. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. Such is the reading of God's word. With the help of the Holy Spirit in your prayers, I just want to talk from this theme, Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus, the light of the world. Now, would that you would flank me with your prayers. Jesus, the light of the world. One of the things you'll notice when you read the scriptures and notice from the scriptures themselves is that when it came to the Hebrew people, they really reveled in and revered their history. They were often celebrating signal and significant moments in their history. They looked back in their history to see not only their relationship with one another, but to see their history with regard to their relationship to God. In fact, Hebrew history is a certain kind of history. When it comes to the Bible, it is Heil's Geschichte. It is salvation history. And uh, Hebrews reveled in their history. They revered their history. It is their history that helped them know who God is. And it celebrated their own relationship with God. And it was their history that helped them know who they were. So it was through their history that they began to know who they were and whose they were. That tells you how important history is. That's why it's important to get the history right, because if history tells you who you are and whose you are, then to get it right gives you the right identity and the right destiny and purpose. Our own country needs to learn something about that when it comes to history. We have, as a country, unfortunately, developed a narrative of our country that does not tell the whole story. And as a consequence, we've developed an identity about ourselves as a country that as a consequence has really twisted history and has left out important parts of it and as a consequence have left out important people in our history. And when you don't do the history right, you don't get the identity right, who you are and whose you are. It's important to know your history, to know it right and know it accurately. Anybody whose skin has been kissed by nature's son knows this. Those of Ebony Hugh recognize, as we look back on our own history, when we were kidnapped from the western shores of Africa and brought to these mundane shores, we know that the attempt to control us and confine us came as they tried to define us so that they can limit us and manipulate us and control us. And the way they did it is by disconnecting us from our history. Because when you don't know who you are and whose you are, you don't know how to behave. It was Maulana Karinga, I believe, who said, if you lose your history, you lose your memory. And if you lose your memory, you lose your mind. It is in the discovery 
of our cultural history that gives us a sense of connection to our identity, who we are and whose we are. The Hebrews had a handle on their history and they would often celebrate signal and significant parts in their history. And Jesus, who makes the statement I just read, he makes this particular statement in the context of the Hebrews celebrating a particular point in their Hebrew history. It was called the Festival of Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a celebration that the people would engage in by putting a comma in the sentence of their lives, pause long enough to recognize and remember that time in their history when they were going through the wilderness and how God brought them safely 40 years through the wilderness to the promised land. Feast of the Tabernacles. It's called Tabernacles because they lived in tabernacles as they went through the wilderness. And so it was a way of remembering what God had done for them. And part and parcel of the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles was, was something called the illumination of the temple. That was a part of the celebration of the Feast of Passover. One evening, they would go into the temple and they would go into the uh, court of the women. The way the temple was constructed was that there was the court of the Gentiles, the outer court. Then there was the court of the women. Then there was the court of the men. There was the court of the priests. And then there was the Holy of Holies. In the court of the women, they would set up four huge candelabras one night during the Feast of Tabernacles and they would light them. And it would not only illuminate and light up the entire courtyard in the court of the women, but it would light the city. People throughout the city could see this huge, luminous light. And while the light was on, the men would come, every great man, every, every scholarly man, every educated man, every good man would come and they would dance in the light all night long and they would sing psalms and they would praise God all night long. And the reason why they would sing and shout and dance and praise God is because of what the light meant. That light was, first of all, uh, a symbol of what God did for 40 years while they were in the wilderness. For if you read the record, you remember that God not only guided them with a cloud by day, listen, but when it got dark and they didn't know which way to go in the wilderness, God was a light at night, a fire or light by night. And for 40 years while going through the darkness at night of the wilderness, they never lost their way because God was their light that led them through the wilderness and the darkness. And so they would praise God for what God had done in their past and brought them 40 years to the promised land. But wait, I'm not even done because the light not only symbolized the light of God who brought them through the darkness of the wilderness of their past, but the light was also a symbol and sign in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah who would be seen as the light of the world. The Messiah would come and just like the light of God lit the darkness of the wilderness in their past as they made their way to the promised land, the Messiah would be the light who would be a light in a dark world. And so they danced, watch this, and they praised God because of the light. And, and can I just pause here parenthetically and point out something about the nature of their praise that's worth mimicking? And that is when they praise God, they didn't just praise God for what God was doing then. They praised God, first of all, because of what God had already done. And when you ever get to the place where you can't think of anything to praise God for, just pause long enough and think about what God has brought you through. If you are anywhere, you are there because God brought you all the way, every step of the way. And I bet you if I pass the mic to somebody who's looking at me right now, you would testify that the darkness you've gotten through, not just in your life, but some darkness you've gone through during the last 20 months in this COVID-19 virus, I bet you, you would testify that the way you made it through sane and safe is because of the light of God or that somehow God helped make a way out of no way. Wait, I'm not even done because not only did they praise God in because of gratitude for what God had done, but I told you they praised God in anticipation 
of what God was going to do. So if you can't think of a thing in your past, and I can't imagine that being the case, and you can't think of anything in your present, I can't imagine that being the case, well, why don't you just praise God in anticipation of what God is going to do? Because if God's track record in your life has been anything like it's been in mine, I'm going to give God praise not only for what he's done or doing, but I'm going to give God praise for what God is going to do because what God has done in my past has blown my mind and what God has done in my present has kept my mind and what I see God getting ready to do in my future is exciting my mind. So I always got a reason to praise God and so do you because of what he's done, what he's doing and what God is going to do because everything God does is always good. They, they praise God and listen, they praise God all night. They praise God until the cock crowed in the morning. They, they weren't the kind of clock watching Christians we have today that if you stay in church too long or worship and praise too long, they're looking at their watch ready for the next thing. No, if God has really been good to you, you ought to quit putting time limits on your praise because God hadn't put time limits on your blessings. God keeps on blessing you over and over and over again. And if God has been blessing you like that, you ought to say, I I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. They praise God in the temple and they praise God in the light. These candelabras lit that place until it was luminous. And they lit it because of the light of the past and the light that they anticipated in the Messiah of the future. It is in this context that Jesus makes this statement. Jesus is in the temple teaching and in the midst of the light, the dancing, the praise. Jesus stood and said, I am the light of the world. He says, and if anyone follows after me, he will not walk in darkness. He says, but if he follows after me, he will not walk in the darkness of this world. But when he follows after me, he will walk in the light of life. That's what Jesus said. Now, that's, that's exciting because they had been dancing in anticipation of the coming of the light, the Messiah. And the light, the Messiah, had come. The Messiah was in their midst. And so the Messiah stood and said, I am the light of the world. It was his way of saying, I am what you're dancing about. I am what you're singing about. I am what you're shouting about. I am what you're praising about. And I am here. God, I wish I had time, because if I had to have time, I talk about how oftentimes we are waiting and praying and praising and anticipating God to do something, and oftentimes we're so busy praising God that we miss God when God moves. We're so busy praying that we miss God when God answers, unless you think I'm not in the Bible. You remember that time when Peter was in jail, and the Bible says that he was, he was delivered out of jail by an angel? They prayed an angel out of heaven, and the angel got Peter out of jail. And the people who were in the prayer meeting, Peter went to the prayer meeting and knocked on the door. Rhoda was at the door. Y'all remember the story? Rhoda was at the door. When she heard Peter's voice, she went into the prayer meeting and told everybody, you can stop praying now because Peter is at the door. And the Bible says they said she was crazy. Wait, they're in there praying that Peter get out. The answer is at the door, but when the answer comes, they don't believe it. Look, don't be so religious that you so engage in religious stuff that you miss the move of God when God moves. You miss the answer when the answer comes. The Bible says that he stood and said, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but you will walk in the light of life. What? What does he mean when he says the light of life? Well, the light of life means two things. The light of life, first of all, means a light that comes from life. That is, life is the source. Light comes from life. So it is the life, the light of life. Life the source. Light comes from the source. The second thing it means is not the source, life, and light coming from the source, but it means light that gives light. So it is not light 
that comes from life. It is also light that gives light. Well, which of these applies to Jesus? Both of them. Can we go to Sunday school? Both of them applies to Jesus. First, Jesus is the light that comes from life because God is the source of all life and Jesus comes from God. Indeed, Jesus is God. So Jesus is the face of God. Jesus is the light of God. And so Jesus comes from the source of life who is God. But he is not only light from life, but this light that comes from life is also a light that gives life. Just like, just like a flower cannot survive it is, if it is not exposed to the light and absorbs the light. What is true about Jesus when he says, I am the light of the world and you will walk if you follow with me in the light of life. What is true about Jesus is that anyone who is exposed to the light, who takes in the light, who surrenders to the light, who opens up to the light, they will receive the light of life. Jesus is the source. John says that in the prologue that he is the light of life. And so those who want life must accept the light. And the light is Jesus the Christ. And so when Jesus says, I am the light, if you follow after me, you won't walk in darkness, but you will walk in the light of life. Jesus is saying, I am the source of life itself. And if you follow me, then you will experience walking in the light of life and not experience a life that is, that is, that is chained in, confined in, confused in, lost in the darkness. Now, if in fact following Jesus is, brings about the light of life, it is the source he is, indeed the source of life itself, then the question is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? I'm glad you asked. You asked good questions. Let's take it apart. William Barclay says that this phrase, follow Jesus, Jesus said, follow me. That phrase, follow, the Greek word there has at least probably five meanings. What does it mean to follow Jesus based upon all of the Greek word pictures that are in that word in the text follow. Well, first of all, to follow Jesus is like uh, a soldier who follows a captain. The soldier follows a captain, the captain of a higher rank, and wherever the captain goes, the soldier follows. So the soldier follows over tough terrain uh, even as he follows the captain. If the captain goes into battle, the soldier follows him into battle. If the captain goes into uncharted, strange territory, doesn't matter how un strange and uncharted it is, uh, the soldier follows behind the captain. Wherever the captain goes, the soldier faithfully follows. And Jesus is saying it is that kind of following that leads to the light of life. It is to follow Jesus wherever Jesus leads. I wish I had time to talk about that, that but that's what it means to follow Jesus, to trust Jesus. Jesus enough to follow Jesus wherever he leads. And wherever Jesus leads is not always sunlit sum, summer days. Sometimes what Jesus leads us is into the teeth of the wind. In fact, I believe it was Bonhoeffer who said whenever Jesus bids us follow him, he bids us come and die. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you got to take up your cross and follow me. Because So sometimes when Jesus, when you follow Jesus, it is not always over uh, a flowery bed of ease, but sometimes it's over tough terrain, but you got to trust him enough to follow Captain Jesus wherever Jesus goes. Not only does that word follow mean a soldier that follows a captain, but it also means a slave that accompanies a master. Now, I know people may bristle against the very notion of slave and slave masters, especially those of Ebony you who have a history of being enslaved, but I want you to know that when you follow Jesus, who is the master, he makes being a slave, he gives being a slave a good name. When you follow a slave, follows a master, he is really at the bidding of the master. He accompanies the master, and whatever the master asks him to do, whatever he commands him to do, the slave does it. And to follow Jesus is to follow like that. That is to trust the master so completely that whatever he bids you do, you do it. And the difference between enslaved verse in our day and our master is that the enslavers of the days gone by were cruel and mean and selfish and self-aggrandizing, but the master we know is a, 
is a compassionate master, is a merciful master, is a loving master, and is a master we can always be certain always has our best interests at heart. So whenever the master says we are to confidently and by faith do, that's what it means to follow the master. It also uh, means uh, to accept wise counsel. That's what it means to follow, to accept wise counsel. There are times when we're trying to do something in this world and we get confused about it. And when we get confused, what we do often is we consult an expert in the thing that we're confused about. And when we consult the expert in the thing that we're confused about, if we are wise, we will follow the counsel, the wise counsel, of the person who's an expert in the thing we're confused about so that we will no longer be confused about it anymore. We can have a solution to the thing that we're confused about. And when, when he says that in the Greek, it means that to follow Jesus means that there are going to be times in our lives where we will be confused. Now, I don't care how saved you are, big Bible, big cross, speak in tongues, with amazing regularity, but still there are times in our lives, as holy and saved as we are, as we get confused along the way. We don't always listen. We don't always know how to do life. But the good news is, is that while we may not know how to do life, there's someone who's an expert in the thing that we don't always know how to do. In fact, the Bible tells us that he is the, the author and the finisher of our faith. It means that Jesus has gone ahead of us and perfectly carved out a path through the wilderness of this world. And if we would just follow him when we get lost or we become confused, we can check with the one who's the expert in life and the one who is the expert in life can help us get through any forks in the road, any bewilderment, any befallment, any confusion. And it would do us well when we, when we come upon a situation where we are confused to consult the one whom the Old Testament says is a wonderful counselor. You always running to mama and him, and mama and him is fine, granny and him is fine, but I promise you, can't nobody do you like Jesus. The first person you ought to go to is not granny and mama in him. The first person you ought to go to is Jesus the Christ, and you ought to seek him until you get clarity about what you're confused confused about this 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 follow thing it's not only about uh accepting wise counsel but it also means obeying the laws of a city or a state so to follow him is to obey the laws of a city and a state if you're going to be a good citizen then you have to follow the laws of a city or a state good state be a good citizen stop at the stop lights and Pay your taxes and cut your grass in the neighborhood and tell you to cut your grass. You're going to be a good uh, citizen and you do those things that make for the common good. So you follow the rules of the city or the state. That's what it means to follow. Well, to follow Jesus means since we are citizens of the kingdom, to follow the principles laid out in the kingdom so that we could be good citizens and the best representatives of the kingdom we say that we are in. We are not citizens of this world permanently. We are just pilgrims passing through on our way to a permanent address. And so as a consequence of being citizens of the kingdom, if we're going to live like kingdom people in a sometimes crazy world, then we got to live according to the principles of the kingdom and according to the lordship of the king. And Wait, I'm not even done. The last one that this follow means, this example of what it means to follow Jesus, is it means to, uh, it means to get the gist of someone who's giving a speech or to follow the logic of the teaching of a, of a teacher. What, what that means is this. When a teacher is teaching, you follow the logic or you understand what the teacher is teaching. To get the gist of a speech means that when somebody's giving a speech, you understand what they're saying when they give the speech. You can understand what they're saying. And that means to follow Jesus, and disciple means learner. To follow Jesus means that you learn from Jesus and understand what Jesus is teaching. And as you understand it, you understand it not so you can impress people with how much you understand, but you understand it so that you can live it. 
So to be a follower of Jesus is to get a, have a closer walk and better understanding of the teachings of Jesus so that you can reflect the very best of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That is, that as you walk in the way of the words of Christ, the teachings of Christ, uh, you begin to look more and more like the one you are following. And that's the intent, my brothers and sisters, whether you realize it or not, and you may not like what I'm about to say, but God's greatest desire for you is not that you be famous. It's not that you be rich. It's not that you finally find your boo or your bae. It's not, it's not even that you be safe. That's not God's greatest desire for your life. God's greatest desire for your life is that you grow to the full stature of the man Christ Jesus. God wants you to be like Christ. And when you begin to follow in the ways of Christ and become more like Christ and develop the fruit of the Spirit or the character of Christ, that's more valuable than any fame or fortune, silver or gold or any notoriety you can get because once you began to discover and discern what it means to walk and talk and live and love and serve like Jesus, you begin to walk with poise and peace and power and you will not be conquered by this world, but you will discover your true identity and that is that you are more than conquerors to him who is in Christ Jesus. So, so Jesus says, if you follow after me as the light of the world, if you follow after me, you will not walk in darkness, but you will walk in the light of life. Jesus is the light that gives life, and as we follow him, we are called to follow Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and as we follow him, we begin to experience the fullness of his promise. For Jesus said, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus stood in the midst of the illumination and the dancing and the singing, and Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Well, when Jesus made this statement, immediately religious leaders became frustrated. If you would read past verse 12, you could see the dialogue, the interchange and exchange between Jesus, and it's amazing. The Bible says that they become frustrated with Jesus. They could not stand the statement that Jesus would make. The way Jesus was talking, they didn't like it. First of all, they didn't like it for the obvious reason because Jesus was claiming by his declaration to be the Messiah, the very one that they were waiting on. They also didn't like what Jesus was talking about. The way he was talking is because Jesus was behaving, he was talking as if he could do what only God could do. And so he makes this claim, I am the light of the world. If you, you won't walk in darkness if you follow me, I'll, you walk in the light of life. And so they challenge him and they tell Jesus, you are not who you say you are. In fact, since they didn't like the fact that he claimed to be the Messiah, that he claimed in this I am statement to be equal with God, they said, you can't be valid in your statement because you are your own witness. And according to the law, the only thing that validates anybody's testimony is that they have to have two or more, two or three witnesses. So you can't simply speak for yourself and that be enough. But that you gotta have two or three witnesses to back you up so you can't be who you say you are simply on the strength of your own words. Well, Jesus responds, and in essence what Jesus says, the only words I really need are my own words. I don't need anybody else to validate me. I don't need anybody else to substantiate me. And when Jesus said that, he wasn't being arrogant or proud for even being self-confident. Jesus was simply talking about what he knew. Jesus knew the closeness of him and the Father. He knew his status with the Father. It is like a surgeon who makes a diagnosis, and he's certain about his diagnosis. It isn't because he's arrogant, it's because he knows what he knows. It's like a judge who makes a judgment on a ruling from the bench. When he makes the ruling, he doesn't make it in pride and arrogance, he makes it because he knows what he knows. Jesus is saying, I'm making this statement about me 
because I know me. I know who I am. Watch. And I don't need somebody else to validate who I know. God, I wish I had time. I wonder if we would be more like if we really knew who we were, we wouldn't need the validation of people on social media. We wouldn't need a certain amount of likes. We wouldn't need people to follow us and continually put us on life support by saying a whole bunch of wonderful things about us for us to love ourselves. When you know that you know that you know that you know who you are, you don't need anybody else to validate you and you certainly don't need anybody else to define you. Jesus said, I know who I am and so I don't need anybody else's word to add weight to my word because I am the word. I don't need another source to substantiate my claim because I am my own source. It, it is, I have the authority because I know what my relationship with God is and God knows what my relationship with God is. So first of all, Jesus responds by saying, you say I need a witness, I say I don't. But since you say the law <laughs> says I need a witness, I have one. He said, there's two of us. There's me and then there's God. God is the witness I have to validate who I am. It is God who put the stamp of approval on my life and ministry. How did God validate him? How did God support and substantiate Jesus? Well, first of all, he validated and substantiated Jesus by supporting Jesus' word. Uh, whenever Jesus spoke, he spoke with a wisdom that was unparalleled. When, when when Nicodemus came to him by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher coming from God. No man can do the things that I do except God be with you. When, when Jesus spoke, his, his wisdom was so unparalleled that even his enemies said, never a man <laughs> spoke like this man. So God validated Jesus' uh, person by supporting Jesus' word. And his word was so saturated and super saturated with divine uh, knowledge uh, that the people had to admit that nobody could speak like Jesus. How did God validate Jesus? Not only his words, but also his works. Yeah. God validated his person by validating his works. When Jesus went about doing things, people said it had to be God. Huh. Nobody opens blinded eyes except God be with them. N nobody uh, makes the lame walk except God be with them. Nobody looks at a pot of water when it stares back at its creator and blushes red in the wine. It has to be God. Nobody makes a storm shut up and when it says shut up, the wind ceases its howling and the waves lay down like a lamb. No, nobody can walk on the water let God be with them. Nobody can take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed 5,000, not including the women and children, unless God is validating them. And nobody can show up at a funeral procession or on its way to the funeral and stop and touch the cast and the dead boy get up and he give the dead boy back to his grieving mother. God has to be in the midst of that. And so God validated the person and mission and ministry of Jesus by giving him the power to do what only God can do. Wait, I'm not even done. What shouts me even more is not simply the miracles that Jesus did in people's lives, but the way God validated Jesus' ministry is because of how people responded to his ministry. Jesus is the only one I know who after he deals with somebody can make a bad man good. Y'all don't hear me. I don't know anybody that can change a person except it be God. Y'all think I'm not in the Bible. Zacchaeus was a crook. He was a rich crook. He was a tax collector that got over on by some people. But the Bible says one day he heard that Jesus was around. So he ran and climbed a sycamore tree just to see Jesus. Jesus said, I want to go to your crooked house. And so he went to the crooked tax collector's house who was the chief tax collector. So he had to be a crooked tax collector to get over on all those people but by the time Jesus got finished with his crook the Bible says he stood and watched went broke messing around with Jesus he said a half of my goods I give to the poor and if I have robbed any man I, I give unto him four folds I'll give him four times in other words Jesus made this rich man engage in reparations I wish I had time to repair the damage of the people he had done because he had been crooked he was a crooked man who went straight because he was messing around which y'all still don't believe it. You, you remember that woman he went out of well, that five times divorcee and one time shacky? By the time G 
Jesus got finished talking to her, she ran into town saying, come see a man that told me all about myself. Is this not the Christ? The Bible says he saw a woman that was thrust in front of him while he was teaching Bible study in the temple. She had been caught in the very act of adultery. And by the time Jesus got finished talking to the crowd with stones in their hands, they had dropped their stones and walked off in shame. And Jesus looked at the woman and said, who's to condemn you? She said, nobody. And the only person qualified to condemn her was Jesus. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. He said, go and sin no more. And, and, and one, Howard, one Howard Thurman says that when he said, go and sin no more, he didn't put a crown on her head. He put a crown above her head and challenged her to grow tall enough to wear. What I'm trying to tell you is that when Jesus comes in contact with people, people were never the same again. God changed harlots. He makes harlots pure. He, he makes drunkards sober. He makes liars tell the truth. He met a crazy man in Tombstone territory and by the time he got finished with him, he sent him to the Decapolis and he went to the ten cities telling everybody about Jesus. Only God can change a life. And so God validated the ministry of Jesus by the power to transform lives. And man, if you don't remember, woman, if you don't remember, y'all, if you don't remember anything I said, remember this. Jesus has the power to change your life. Why? Because he is God with us. He is the language of eternity translated into the words of time. He is the visible image of the invisible God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Words were God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory even as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He is the light and He can give you the light of life if you will simply follow after Him. Jesus, He, he wasn't even finished with Him. After Jesus said that, Jesus went on to say to them, uh, you don't even know God. Yeah, he's talking to some religious leaders. And he said to them, he ends up saying, you don't even know God. Y'all carry his name around, you don't know him. He said, you don't know God because if you knew God, you got to read past verse 12. He said, if you knew God, you would accept me. But because you reject me, it is evidence that you don't know God. Yeah, yeah, you claim to know God. You know the scriptures, but you don't know God. You know the hymns, but you don't know God. You know church, my God, but you don't know God. And what I'm trying to tell you, my brothers and sisters, uh, that the goal of Christ is not to make you religious. Talk to me, somebody. The goal, the key to eternal life is a relationship with the one who says, I am the light of the world and once you get connected to Jesus everything else will find its priority but the worst thing that could happen to anybody is that they know the Bible but they don't know the God in the Bible that they know worship but they don't know the one who we are called to worship that they know hymns but they don't know the one whom the hymn praises they know the 23rd Psalm but they don't know the shepherd in the Psalm the worst thing that could happen is that you can know about God but you don't know God for yourself. Jesus said, you don't know me because you, if you knew God, you would accept me, but because you've rejected me, it is evidence that you don't know God. And the sad tragedy is that in the prologue of John, I'm done, the prologue of John, John says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. What a tragedy to be looking for God and to be so religious. <sighs> that you are doctrinally sound, but you are not relationally right. And God be in the midst, and you miss him. And I don't want you to miss God. This is your moment. Don't miss your moment. God is in the midst. Now, what I love about the text, and I'll be done, is the same text I just quoted, if you keep reading in John's prologue, John said, he came into his own, and his own received him not. But, I love it, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons and daughters of God. And the good news is today that you don't have to reject him, but if you would just accept him today, he will give you the power. Uh, he will give you 
the right to become the sons and daughters of God. Nobody comes to the Father except by Jesus. And nobody has the right or the authority unless it's given to them by Jesus. But as many as receive him, to them gives he the power, give her the power to become. And that word power doesn't mean the ability to do something. That's not what that power is. That, we don't have the power to do it ourselves. That is the right to exercise the power. That is that by the authority of Christ, we become sons and daughters of the living God. And if you just let me testify, I don't know anything greater. I don't know anything grander. I don't know anything more blessed than to be a child of the living God. I don't know about you, but what excites me is that I'm an heir and a joint heir with Jesus. Y'all don't even know where to shout because if you're an heir and a joint heir with Jesus, that means that everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to me. That means I've already got the victory. So whatever life brings my way, you can bring and do give it your best shot. Because I've got, I'm equipped with everything I need to, to face anything that comes my way. And is there anybody who has that kind of blessed assurance? Is there anybody who can get up in the morning and not even know what the day will bring, but still say in your heart of hearts, since I got Jesus, whatever the day brings, as long as I got Jesus, I'm going to be all right. I believe that's why the songwriter said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation, purchased by God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Can I tell you why Jesus is enough? He's enough because of what he did for me if he was willing to die on Calvary for me then Jesus is enough they whipped him for me that makes him enough when they put a crown of thorns on his head and his blood like sweat streaming down he did that for me and that's enough for me he carried the cross up the Via Del Rosa he did it for me and that's enough for me they hung him high and they did it for me and that's enough for me they stretched him wide and that's enough for me but he did it for me he looked out over the vistas of history and said father forgive Bruce he don't know what he's doing he did it for me and that's enough for me then he cried to this time it is finished when he cried that was enough for me he died he died to make me holy he died to set me free that's enough for me they put him in a bar or tomb all day Friday all day Saturday that's enough for me but early Sunday morning he got This dark world, in this sinful and broken world, in this wayward and derelict world, in this sometimes brutal, violent, and confusing world, in this dark world we live in, Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus himself said, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness but you will walk in the light of life life is the birthright of those who surrender
to the light. The Bible says, the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. What it means simply is the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't handle the light. <laughs> there is nothing stronger than light. It doesn't matter how dark it gets, it can't put out the light. In fact, the darker it is, the brighter the light. Light shines, darkness can't handle it. Which means that in the end, it's the light that wins. <laughs> and in your heart, it's the light that wins. And in history, it's the light that will win. You ought to get on the winning side. <laughs> you ought to get on the side of the one who is the light of the world. This is your chance. Oh, whatever you do, don't miss this moment. Whoever you are, man, woman, boy, or girl, this is your chance. Don't walk away from this message. Don't walk away from the light. I'm not offering you religion. I ain't even offering you church. <laughs> no, I'm offering you Jesus. For Jesus is the light that gives life. Today could be the first day of the rest of your new life. If you would simply say yes. There's somebody waiting to hear from you right now. Uh, at the phones, here at the church, they're waiting on you. Mm -hmm. All you got to do is dial the number 502 636-0523 and there was somebody on the other end of that line who's waiting to share with you how you can have eternal life in Jesus Christ if you want to be saved today's a good day to be saved <laughs> perhaps you want to join the church well you can join right there online if you would just call in they can tell you how you can be a member of Base Memorial wherever you are in the world you can claim membership here at Base Memorial. Or perhaps you want prayer. I promise you there's somebody on the other end of that line <laughs> that knows how to pray for you. And they will. Or maybe you need all three. You want to be saved. You want to join this church. And you want somebody to pray for you and yours. They'll be happy to do all three. But whatever you do, don't miss this moment. Jesus is the light. And Jesus is the light that brings life. Come on today. Don't let this moment pass you by. I'll do. Use me, Lord. To show. And enable. My story, my story is empty, and I, and I am available to you. Hallelujah. You can keep on calling the number on the screen. We're so excited. We're so grateful. We're so thankful to be able to bring this word to you. We hope and pray that somehow my feeble efforts at de declaring God's word, that God has somehow empowered his message to find a place in your heart. So that one day you might come to know Christ for yourself. I hope that day is today. I hope you finally say yes to the Lord. We're able to do this. Uh, we're so grateful to, to the members of Base Memorial. We're able to bring you this broadcast because of the faithful members of Base Memorial who give faithfully. Uh, not only the members of Base Memorial, but there are friends of Base Memorial who don't may not claim membership here, but they believe God is at work in this ministry, and so they give regularly to the ministry to support uh, the ministry we know they know that we are a blessing to the community and we try our best to make Jesus famous and so since they are supporters of Jesus they support us financially our members do that because they are not simply consumers who take from the ministry but they are producers who give to the ministry and so we thank God for their faithfulness so all the members of Base Memorial and those who are friends of Base Memorial, thank you so much. And perhaps you weren't in either of those categories, but today you want to start giving. Perhaps you've seen or heard something.
about the ministry or even in this message today that has convinced you that you want to support it financially there are several ways you can support it you can support it by a cash app that's dollar sign base memorial and it'll go right to our account you can give uh online go to basememorial.com click on the giving tab and follow brief instructions and it'll go right to our account as well you can text to give the information is on the screen you can text vision and then any amount to 73256 and that will go to our account as well uh, some people prefer coming by and dropping it off while they're out and about that's convenient for them and there's someone here during office hours who will take uh, that gift that they give their tithe their offering or sacrificial giving and they will uh, make sure it gets where it's supposed to get if none of those ways are the way you prefer and you would like to mail it in well we accept snail mail so just make sure you write your check or give your monies to uh, Bates Memorial uh, 620 East Lampton Street 620 East Lampton Street Louisville Kentucky 40203 and uh, when your mail your gift gets here we will make sure it gets where it's supposed to go we are super excited and delighted to be able to uh, bring this word to you and we're really excited about the prospect of going back into in-person worship please keep your ears and your eyes open there's going to be a message coming soon uh, that is going to give you some more details about when we're coming back in but it will be pretty soon and we're excited about it and we're going to be ready for you we know you're going to be ready for us and we are going to have a time we like to end with a benediction but before the benediction uh, this blessing and we don't want you to leave without getting this blessing we do have some important announcements to share and so if you would uh, stay right there, receive these announcements, and I'll be re right back right after these announcements. What's up, Bates Memorial family and friends? Listen, this is the year that we're serving with a made-up mind, and we've got a lot that you can get involved in. Check this out. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2 reads like this. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Bates Memorial family and friends, it's the 2021 Senior Weekend Celebration at Bates Memorial. This year's theme, Still Faithful. Join us Saturday and Sunday, November the 20th and 21st for a celebration to honor our senior saints. Special musical guests include saxophonist Andre Wilson and Minister Troy Bell and SOS. And the preached word will be brought by none other than Pastor Richard Gaines, pastor of the Consolidated Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. It's our senior weekend celebration at Bates Memorial, and it would be our pleasure to have you celebrate with us. with the Bates Health Ministry, and November's health focus is being aware of lung diseases like COPD. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease refers to a group of diseases that causes airflow blockage and breathing-related problems. According to the CDC, 16 million Americans have problems breathing because of COPD. Even more suffer from this disease, but have not been diagnosed. 
While there is no cure, it can be treated and prevented. The main cause of COPD is tobacco smoke, exposure to air pollutants at home and in the workplace, genetic factors, and respiratory infections also play a factor. If you are experiencing frequent coughing or wheezing, excessive phlegm or mucus shortness of breath, and trouble taking a deep breath, you may have COPD. See your doctor for a simple test called spirometry, which is used to measure lung function and detect COPD. For more preventative information, contact your doctor or contact the Bates Health Ministry at Bates Health Ministry 620 at gmail.com. Calling all health professionals and health enthusiasts. Your health ministry needs your help. Please contact us to find out how you can serve. This is Marita. I hope you're staying safe and stay well. Signing out, giving you your November's health tip. That's what's going on here at Bates Memorial, and we want you to get involved. Amen. God bless you. We hope and pray that you enjoyed those announcements and that you paid attention and that you'll govern yourselves accordingly and benefit from those. Uh, again, we want to thank all the members of Bates Memorial and the friends for giving. Don't let the fact that we are not meeting keep you from our responsibility and privilege of giving to the kingdom cause. Make sure you do that. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll uh, pray for us. We'll be praying for you. And we want to end with this benediction, this blessing that we want to give you. Receive this benediction, this blessing. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee, the Lord. Lift up the light of his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And give thee peace. And give thee peace. Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the church and everyone else said, Amen. Amen.